Awesome. So I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started, and we'll we'll have everyone um, who's trickling in um, join us. But um, can everyone see my? Well, I don't actually know if I shared my screen. Let's see. Can everyone see my screen? I don't. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay. we see. It. Great. Okay. Yes, it worked. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for um, joining us today, everyone. My name is Trisha Tobolsky. I'm an associate program officer with the Board on Life Sciences, and I'm working on this, this project um, that we're holding an information gathering session on the topic of biotechnology startups focused on RNA sequencing and mo um, modifications. And I'll start out with just a few quick housekeeping items before I pass it over to Nick Adams, who's gonna be moderating our session today. Um, so just an overview of our activity um, under which this information gathering session is being organized. So this is a meeting that's an information gathering session for a consensus study that is um, focused on sequencing and mapping of RNA modifications. And the study itself is funded, the study and the meeting are funded by Warren Alpert Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our workshop planning committee and our consensus study committee, um, and also our staff team who has helped us to um, put together and plan this information gathering session and who are working on the consensus study um, as a whole. Um, and just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, you can feel free to make comments and ask questions by using the chat, or you can use your raise hand function in Zoom and we'll call on you. Um, if you have any technical questions or issues, you can contact our program assistant, Nam Vu, who's um, in the room, and also you can um, find his email here. Any comments and ideas made during the meeting should be attributed to the individual speakers and not their organization, unless otherwise stated. Any thoughts shared during this meeting should not be interpreted as the opinion of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, or the committee conducting the study. Um, the meeting will be recorded and is being recorded um, for use by the committee. Um, and then also, finally, harassment and bullying will not be tolerated. So please be respectful of all fellow participants and speakers during the meeting. Um, and with that, I'm um, pleased to pass it over to our moderator, Nick Adams, who is also um, a member of our consensus study uh, committee. Nick? Hey there. Yeah. Uh, so I. So I'm Nick Adams. I'm a systems engineer at Thermo Fisher and a member of this committee. Um, so I'm going to go over uh, a little bit of background to provide context for this information gathering session. Um, this is the, the committee's statement of task, which has been assigned to this committee. Um, if you've uh, checked out the website, maybe you've seen this. Um, just a little bit of context. So uh, we're, we're tasked with conducting a consensus study on the needs in the emerging field of epitranscriptomics. Um, specifically, as you can see here, it's uh, we're tasked with developing a roadmap for achieving direct sequencing of RNA and its modifications. And we're doing this by examining the bullet points listed here. Um, if you go to the next slide, the three that we're focused on uh, for this information gathering session with those that are invited, uh, are related to the scientific needs, the current methodologies and their limitations, and then potential new technologies. Uh, and so before I share these meeting goals, maybe I'll give a little bit of context. So this committee has been mindful of some of the lessons learned from the Human Genome Project, which we see as sort of a reference for us in putting uh, uh, this consensus study together. Um, the Human Genome Pro Project also came on the heels of a, a National Academies uh, consensus study. And uh, so we've been looking at that. And one of the lessons that we've learned uh, is maybe that the value of uh, industry, and in particular, maybe startup companies, uh, was initially overlooked and became a strong, a strong player in the Human Genome Project. And we perceive that startup companies will also be a major, major players in uh, epitranscriptomics and sequencing and mapping uh, RNA modifications. And so it, our hope is to engage and integrate biotech, uh, the biotech industry, large companies and small companies 
small companies into this effort, which is in part the basis for this information gathering session. And so here we're bringing together experts in, from biotech startups uh, to discuss state of the art for direct sequencing of RNA and their modifications and related uh, therapeutic applications. So the goals of this meeting, these two bullet points here, to understand the state of the art technology uh, for direct sequencing <clears throat> of RNA modifications, and then highlight ongoing and planned research development activities uh, by your companies and uh, understand the drivers for innovation. Uh, with respect to what we're doing with the uh, putting together this consensus study report, we're going to be interested in, and, and we'd love to hear uh, not just about your company's technologies, current and future uh, projected technologies, but also uh, any insights on what drives innovation in your companies, uh, insights related to uh, orchestrating concerted efforts between industry and biotech and government, if you have any uh, experiences with that, and then also identifying you know, major technology gaps or challenges that might be required to achieve your goals. So with that, I think we can go straight yeah, into this, the presentations. Uh, the five uh, of you will be given presentations, like Tricia said, Steve Brook will be uh, joining later. Um, but uh, we'll start with Paul Mola. Um, so I'll give just a really brief background, Paul, while you're pulling up your slides, but Paul's the president and CEO of Roswell Biotechnologies. He's previously a leader at Applied Biosystems and Life Technologies and launched the Ion Torrent, which is the first semiconductor-based sequencer. And uh, he continues to scale biology with uh, semiconductor uh, chips. So with that, go ahead, Paul. And Paul, I don't know if you've started speaking, but uh, I haven't heard anything from you. You may be on mute. Hey, there you go. Sorry about that. Okay, we can hear you now. Okay. No, I I appreciate the opportunity and uh, applaud the effort here. So, um, a, a big part of my career really has been figuring out how to integrate biology onto chips. And as, uh, as uh, Nick indicated, uh, I have done this through various other, uh, op various other opportunities, specifically at LifeTech, where we actually launched the first semiconductor sequencing technology. And then I was also involved with some of the work that was done at Genia, where they were interrogating single molecules uh, using nanopores. And um, that's what really led me then to myself and my co-founder to start Roswell. And really, the idea is that we're trying to figure out how to go to all electronic sensing or, or all electronic biodetection. And that allows us then to be to be on chip uh, and have a, a system that is very scalable, but also very robust in terms of its applications. So um, just some of the fundamental design principles we followed is, you know, one is we need a system that can help us achieve really low cost, which will help with the sort of mapping that, you know, uh, this, this uh, you, you're talking about here, for example, having sub $100 chips and, and very low cost uh, transcriptomes and very low cost uh, uh, sort of methylation profiling as well. Uh, to do this, we, like I said, we need to be on chip in a way that is scalable, which means the sensor itself needs to be a nano sensor. So unlike some of the other technologies like uh, Ion Torrent or Genia, where they deployed the sensing element itself was macro, but then it was deployed on uh, a nanotechnology, which is the underlying CMOS. So there was a bit of an incompatibility in terms of how that scales. And so we specifically needed it to be nano. We wanted to achieve single molecule resolution as well. Uh, and this will become important as you think about having the resolution then to, to read methylation, uh, which we believe is, is actually, um, uh, you get better resolution if you can read single molecules uh, versus ensembles. Uh, and then the platform we created is really also very programmable. And that means that it is also capable of multi-omic sensing as well. DNA proteins, uh, et cetera. So with those design principles and also based on some of the 
previous experience that we've had with bringing other chip technologies to market, we, we found it then Roswell. And I'll introduce the, the sensor itself in the next slide. Um, so let's consider any two molecules that interact you know, in biology. This could be antibody antigen, this could be you know, DNA strand with its complement, any two molecules that interact in nature. What, what we do is we take any of the two and we, we wire that onto this little circuit here, which is essentially a current meter, and wire one of the pro, one of the molecules as a probe onto the circuit. Uh, in this case, really, these are you know metal electrodes at the end here, and then we use a. In in our case, in, in in this example, we actually use a peptide or very specific sequence that conducts uh, you know conducts electricity. And we have metal binding domains at the end, and so we can actually uh, program it and and uh, actually make it part of the circuit by you know conjugating the probe onto onto it. And so this is this is again the probe conjugated onto a peptide bridge, and then uh, we click that into a current meter. Now the way this works is you know consider this particular unbound state to have a specific you know, resistance. And what happens is that when it binds its complement, you can actually change that resistance. And so the readout is essentially current versus time. And we can actually see that dynamic interaction of, you know, in one state when it's not bound, it has, you know, you have a given current level. Then when it is bound, you see the current level jump up uh, in this case. And so you see these on off states which are pretty much then the dynamic interaction of that probe with its target. Hmm. And so you have the real-time dynamic view of the interactions. And again, this probe target could be pretty much any biomolecule you choose to, to have. So once we achieve this and actually saw that, yes, we're getting the readout we, we, you know, we, we desired, we then took this circuitry and then we deploy that on a standard semiconductor chip, which is shown on the right hand side here. This is actually uh, an SEM image of a Gen 3 chip. This is, it has 16,000 sensors on it. Now, each pixel, which is sort of the blue dot here, is represented and arrayed multiple times, uh, in this case, 16,000 across, across this chip. And so, because now it's on chip, and also we've achieved uh, what we've been trying to achieve, which is molecular sort of um, molecular size, uh, so to speak. In this case, the gap size is around 20 nanometers. So it's very amenable because it is nano scale to deploying on a nanotechnology, which means it's actually very scalable. And so the scaling limit then really opens up and you can have very high, high throughput chips, uh, so to speak. So, so with that, um, we then uh, just to give a, a sense of how how do you program this little probe into the circuit. So the way we do it is is we have this again. Let's call it a molecular wire, and we have this probe conjugated onto it. Then what we do is we can either wait for this to self assemble, where the the probe you know will move by diffusion and eventually find the electrodes and click in place, but that will take time and it's not efficient. And so what we do is we actually use electrical forces. Um, we create a dielectric dielect dielectric field, in this case shown here, and we can actually polarize the, the, the molecular wire and that draws in and it clicks in place and we complete the circuit. In the example shown below here, uh, this is uh, an open circuit, so there's no wire. And we do one, two, three, four attempts of active bridging. These are very fast you know, cycles of active bridging. And once the wire in starts in place, the bridge is inserted, you see a jump in conductivity and that particular electrode is actually bridged. And, and we observe that in this case using, uh, we just have, we call a dumbbell bridge, but these are just um, um, sort of gold, gold beads that are attached to the wire and we can actually visualize them and you can see it's clicked in place. So we use these oh, electrodes. Can I ask a quick question? Is this are there is there an aqueous solvent in this on your yes. chip? Okay, yes. thank you. Yes. 
Yes, there is. So once this is programmed, then you're ready to, to run your assay and, and, and get going. Here's an example of uh, how we, we program the bridge. So in this case, uh, because we can access each row uh, one at a time individually and polarize it uh, one at a time and bridge one, at a one row at a time, I'm showing an example here where row two to seven, we choose uh, not to bridge. So there's no wire here. And then we do this serially, then row eight to 13, we, we wire in a bare molecular wire. So in this case, it's just a wire without the probe. And then in this case, row 14 to 49, we have a wire with a specific, uh, in this case, it was an antibody. Uh, and then we sort of repeat just for the sake of having controls to show you what the data looks like, uh, a bare wire and no wire. And these are actual traces. And the way we, we run the experiments is fast. Once we've wired the, the chip or programmed the chip, we just flow in buffer and you can see it's just, there's no signal at all, it's just flat. And then we start to, to flow in the target and, and we do this, we titrate the target just to observe it. And you, you, you do it in increasing concentrations from low concentration to high concentration. And you see that the chip or the, the, um, the, the rows or the, the, the pixels that have the specific antibody bound to them, when I introduce increasing, increasing concentration of its, of its active target, I actually get these sort of signals. And, and you can then use that and carry that to analysis, which I'll show in the next few slides. So this is how we program the chip. It's a very fast process. Uh, this can be done at your site, or it can be done at the factory if there's specific uh, uh, sort of probe molecules you like, that is, it can be done either way, but it's a very fast and efficient process. Here's an example where we have a probe uh, as a, a rather DNA oligo as a probe. And in this case, we are really trying to assess what it, how does it interact with its complement target. And so this is the unbound state. This is the bound state. And what we do is we're showing here again, just a very, short about uh, six seconds of data where we show this dynamic interaction of the on-off state as the probe or oligo binds its complement. And the way this data looks is the, the bound state usually shows up in this elevated uh, sort of um, current versus this is the unbound state, which is a noise bound. And you can see very two distinct states that are showing up here. Now, I don't have it in this slide, but if we do introduce, say, a mutation in this, in this signal, it does change the kinetics in the, and we can actually observe it. So it's very, very sensitive, even at a single uh, base pair mismatch level. And we can see various uh, sort of interactions um, resulting in different kinetics and different profiles. This is all label free. There's no, no dyes. Uh, you have single molecule sensitivity. Like I say, this is a very short, uh, uh, sort of example of a, a few seconds that it's very rich in information. And um, again, it's it's very scalable as, as you need to. Can I ask a question, please, Paul? Yes. So you say it's very sensitive, single molecule. Uh, is it, and the chemists don't like this, is it substoichiometric? So say if you had one molecule in a hundred that had the modification of a certain location, would that be something you'd be able to pick out and quantify with this technology? Technically, you can. Um, I couldn't speak to one versus 100, but if you did have them at a given ratio, you should be able to. Uh, we are using this, for example, to do allosteric binding, where you're looking at different states of the same uh, target interacting in different ways, and we can actually pick those out. Thank you. Sure. Hey, so, Paul, I just want to check in. Um, we're going to we have about two or three more minutes of slides, and then we'll leave about five minutes for questions. Um, and so maybe, uh, I, and I don't know how many slides you have left, but if maybe questions can be added to the chat and then Paul could answer them uh, throughout the rest of the meeting. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So I'll, I'll be fast, but again, this is just showing you how we, we look at the data. Uh, we derive the full kinetics, uh, you know, uh, the, the time bound, uh, time waiting, uh, the profiles of the fix, uh, we can uh, then use that then to, to um, get your single, um, your sort of classical measures and derive the KMK of, which we use a lot of our analysis derived from that. Uh, here, just showing that you do have uh, 
concentration sort of um, how concentration shows up where the wait time is longer if you have a lower concentration versus it's shorter when you have a high concentration. And, and that's how we, we do some of the analysis. I'm, I'm gonna jump to the slide that specifically speaks to methylation. And in this case, what we do is we actually wire into the circuit a DNA polymerase enzyme. And the DNA polymerase is conjugated to the molecular wire, again, the peptide bridge. And what we do then is we introduce then a DNA strand and then introduce the, the bases and, and then the DNA starts to add one base at a time and that results in incorporation spikes that we then read out. Um, and this is essentially, um, let me show this slide. Uh, this just shows the physical path of the electrons and how we think the signal is being derived, but it's a full sort of the conformational change as the DNA polymerase incorporates a base, all that conformational change uh, and the and the, the 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 charge effect of the base itself is what gives us the resolution to to call out uh, the sequence. Um, so here you go. Uh, in this case, we run a homopolymer of just A's uh, and a homopolymer of C's. This is one C strand of DNA. As you can see, we can actually resolve homopolymers very well. Uh, the A spikes have a very different phenotype from the C spikes, which is shown here. And we can actually discriminate uh, in this case, just show that with a greater than 90% accuracy of A's versus C's in this case. Now, when we introduce uh, sort of a methylated uh, sequence in this case, we had a template that had sort of a methylated region versus unmethylated. And we can actually be able then to resolve. And at this point, you know, where we are in the state of the development, we know that, uh, you know, 99% or 100% accuracy, but this is still an evolving application development. But we do see that you do get very different profile, incorporation profiles of, of native versus uh, methylated uh, bases, uh, so to speak. So, you know, there's a paper we've published. It's a PNAS paper, um, really, um, it's our seminal paper where we, we've shown a little bit of this data, but really um, excited that we'll be able to, to actually deploy and bring these technologies to market in a way that is quite transformational. So with that, I'll just pause and uh, answer any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Paul. All right. So any, any questions uh, for Paul? Okay, so I maybe I'll start. So um, this is so this is really interesting and uh, compelling data that you have, and uh, it's focused on DNA methylation. Do you? And I know you know startups you have to be focused, and uh, but do you do you consider opportunities for uh, looking at RNA and uh, and also RNA modifications, and have you thought of strategies and in, in how you would do that? Well, I, as an organization, I, our strategy has really been that we we want to enter the market in a way that is quite differentiated. Uh, we see some of the work that is being done by the Grails of the world, and 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 we believe that the solutions they have are really not scalable, sort of for patient population use from a cost perspective. And so, yeah, so it is a very interesting area for us to be able to provide solutions. Uh, around methylation, but also in a way that you can read uh, these sequences in, from a sort of multi-omic signature that includes uh, methylation as well. And it's an area we're pursuing because we feel that we are quite differentiated to make a, uh, a big dent and difference in this from an application perspective. Yeah, uh, so, uh, and Saraf has a question. Yeah, so Paul, uh, great talk. So uh, I'm curious if the association between signal and the nucleotides, I may have missed it. Is this a one-to-one -one or two-to-one? Meaning at any given point, the signal is corresponding to how many bases from what you presented? So the, the signal, each, each spike is an, in, in, is an incorporation spike for one base. Um, and so each base as it's getting incorporated relates to the full sort of transformation of the, the polymerase sort of act opening up, grabbing the enzyme and incorporating it and clicking it in place. And that's one spike. Um, and we adjust the frequency of the read 
to, to sort of match that incorporation spike. And you can adjust the, the read frequency so that either it's really higher resolution or, or lower res resolution. And then what we've also done in some cases is actually modify the base itself with a charge so that it's a charge level base. And then you can actually be able to even either enhance or quench the signal depending on what the application is. Thank you. Okay. Great. Brenda? Um, yes, thank you very much. I, I, I like the, the, the chip format and I in your chip format is uh, you know, multi, we have, you have different uh, molecules. You have, I'm wondering, um, are they, do you need uh, multiple channels for each sample or do you envision these are multiple samples on the chip? Uh, I envision that these are going to be um, single sample, one time use and toss it out. Right, so it's sort of a disposable chip. But you, you bring up a good question. And the, the way we think about it versus multiplex sort of samples of patients on it, to increase the, the resolution, we can actually have different polymerases interrogating the same sample in different ways so that you can get a, a richer data set. So different polymerases may give different signatures for methylation. And so then you will pull all that data to get even more higher accuracy a high accuracy uh, sort of methylation profiles. Um, there's it, ways, thank you. Yeah, there's ways you can introduce lanes as well if you wanted to do multiple samples as well. Great. Okay, so uh, we have one more question and we're about out of time, but Byron, uh, go for it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so my question was, uh, I really I really like the approach. I really like the technology. It was interesting that you're talking about differenti differentiating from other technologies as it looked like there were some overlaps between the nanopore situation, which is built specifically for DNA and they haven't optimized an RNA pore, and also depicts this, who do this sort of magnetic RNA characterization effort. So I was wondering, how, what do you see as the main differentiating factor between you and those two technologies? Well, I, I think in the case of, of nanopores, right, they, they rely on, on, you need to floss the DNA through the pore multiple times. And, and you don't have necessarily direct single mole, single base resolution. You have to use algorithms to extrapolate because you have three to five bases in the pool at a time. Uh, in our case, it's, it's truly direct read of one base at a time. And then from a scaling perspective, uh, the, the nanopore resides in the lipid bilayer. So we feel it's, it's a bit of a macro on chip, uh, which is what Genia was doing versus this is truly at a, at a molecular scale. So from a scaling perspective, I, we believe this will scale better. Uh, we believe that we have a better potential for higher accuracy because it's a direct read. And then the way we can array also very different polymerases, it's more natural for a polymerase to be interrogating sort of a, a DNA versus it's unnatural for a, a, the DNA to be flossing through a pore. It, it, it didn't evolve to do that in nature versus a DNA polymerase does that in, in nature. So we just feel it's a different, better approach. Great. Thanks, Paul. All right, so I think we'll transition to the next speaker now. If you have other questions, put them in the chat. I know, Paul, there's already one in there. If you wanna access the chat, maybe you could respond to that. Uh, sure. the, next, the next speaker we have is Martin Huber. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Quantapore. All right. I also have a question for Paula, but I, I put it in the chat for, for later. Just um, uh, so let me. I probably need to swap. Is this the full screen now? That looks perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll jump right into it, Nick, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for the invite. Again, my name is Martin Huber. I'm the founder of uh, uh, Quantapore. And we have uh, developed a nanopore-based um, DNA and, and protein uh, sequencing system. So uh, uh, a disclaimer maybe uh, up front. Uh, the one thing that we haven't done yet is RNA sequencing. And I know this meeting is about RNA uh, sequencing and modifications of RNA, detecting modifications. Uh, but I talked to Nick and Trisha prior to this meeting and we found it 
may be interesting to this committee to learn about uh, our technology. And we already had some some discussions about RNA sequencing actually after that uh, initial call. And we, you know, we'll be able to do that uh, with our system. We just haven't focused on it. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, we have uh, developed a, an optical nanopore uh, based approach uh, to read uh, DNA. And more recently, uh, we realized that we can also use this to analyze proteins, uh, the sequence of proteins on a single molecule level. Uh, maybe quick uh, background. As Paul, uh, prior to uh, starting Quantapore, I was at Ion Torrent. Uh, I was much earlier than Paul. I was the third employee at Ion Torrent uh, here on the West Coast. Uh, and after the acquisition through Life Technologies, uh, I realized that there is a lot uh, that can be improved uh, on the sequencing, uh, at that point, DNA sequencing uh, with respect to sample prep, read length, cost, et cetera. Uh, that kind of motivated me to uh, start Quantapore uh, to build a multi omics uh, platform uh, capable of reading reading DNA and eventually uh, proteins. Um, I think I can skip through this slide here. Uh, everybody knows uh, the numbers. And as you can see, well, okay, the RNA is missing here. Uh, that's because, again, we focused on DNA, then realized we can do proteins or the proteoforms. Uh, but I promise we'll, we'll look at RNA. The, the system is capable of doing it. So um, I want to start off with uh, talking a little bit about the, our uh, DNA sequencing approach, how it works, uh, and then move on to the, to the uh, protein uh, fingerprinting. Um, so hang on a second. Here we go. Uh, so our, our, if you will, sample prep or, or, or library prep is um, a little bit simpler than, uh, you know, the classical sequencing by synthesis approaches in a way that we don't need to amplify the DNA. Uh, our sample prep is a, uh, a primary extension uh, reaction where you have uh, the DNA strand, uh, the template strand uh, that's shown here in gray, uh, a primer that binds to uh, the DNA strand uh, shown here in green. Uh, and that can be directly on the sequence or to a, uh, uh, an adapter that's ligated to the, uh, the DNA strand. And then we have a uh, polymerase uh, that uh, copies the template strand and uh, it incorporates uh, fluorescent labeled nucleotides. Uh, the polymerase is a, an evolved polymerase. It's not a natural polymerase in order to be able to uh, incorporate these modified uh, nucleotides. Uh, the polymerase copies the DNA at the end falls off, uh, we do a, a purification step to uh, remove un, uh, unincorporated nucleotides, polymerase primer, and so on. And then uh, as a last step, <clears throat> we uh, attach the double-stranded DNA uh, via biotin that's uh, attached to the five prime of the, of the primer uh, to a nanoparticle uh, that's streptavidin uh, modified. Um, and that's it. So the whole process is relatively quick to extend. I mean, it's like a single, uh, single cycle PCR, if you will. Uh, the extension is we usually do it for five, five to ten minutes, just to make sure that everything goes to uh, completion. The binding uh, to the nanoparticles is also the same range, a few minutes, uh, and then the DNA is ready uh, for sequencing. Um, but we then add the uh, nanoparticle. Uh, with the attached, uh, labeled, double-stranded DNA uh, to our nanopore chip. And you can see here a, a, a cross-section of a single nanopore. So there is obviously a multitude of nanopores in, in our uh, chip. These are solid-state nanopores, so no uh, proteins or bilayers involved. Um, and you can see the cross-section here of a single nanopore. Uh, there is a little bit of simplified uh, depiction here, we have a silicon nitride membrane, a metal layer, uh, and we apply a uh, electric field across the membrane. 
so the next nano force it's here. There's one over here, obviously. Um, and then by applying this electric field, uh, we attract the uh, nanoparticle uh, with the attached DNA uh, and pull the DNA into the uh, nanopore. The nanoparticle itself is bigger than uh, the solid state nanopore. And with that, the translocation stops when the nanoparticle gets plugged into the, into the pore. And then in the trans buffer, um, which is this part here, we have a, an enzyme, uh, an exonuclease, uh, that starts digesting uh, the labeled DNA strand. The labeled nucleotides that are released uh, are diffusing then uh, towards the laser excitation zone. So we have a laser that's uh, illuminating the, the bottom part of the chip continuously. Uh, the metal layer prevents the laser from penetrating through the nanopore, so we don't have any uh, photo bleaching uh, happening inside the nanopore. And the released nucleotides are then detected uh, by a, a, a CMOS camera uh, that's part of the sequencing uh, platform. Let me just go back here. So the again, the electric field uh, attracts the nanoparticle with the DNA. Uh, the DNA gets pulled into the nanopore, stops the translocation, and then the exonuclease is digesting uh, the labeled DNA and the uh, labeled nucleotides are then uh, diffusing out of the nanopore into this laser excitation zone uh, and generate fluorescent signal uh, and photo bleach very quickly uh, in that process. Um, the monster exonuclease has uh, digested the DNA um, the signal stops, right? There's no more signal generated. We then turn off the uh, electric field and the nanoparticle diffuses away uh, immediately. And then we turn on the electric field again and we reload the nanopores. And that's, that cycle then is repeated. Uh, and we, that's how we generate, uh, you know, multiple reads uh, per, per nanopore. Um, so legal told me I can't show uh recent uh, uh data so this is some very early data that we generated um where we used two different um uh, colors but you know the signal looks pretty much the same it's a little bit more you know complex from you know different templates but um so this is a, a an artificial template uh that we used uh, so the template is the top strand this is where the primer binds to the template and then copies the dna where we have these uh, with a red label, uh, the ATP, and the green label, the UTP. Uh, the exonuclease will bind to this side of the, the template. So it's attached to the nanoparticle over here via the five prime uh, biotin. And then the exonuclease will digest DNA in this direction, releasing first the green signal, and then the red signal, uh, which you can see here. So each of these spikes, is a single nucleotide. Uh, so similar to what Paul mentioned before, we also, or unlike, I should say, uh, Oxford nanopore or, or any other uh, uh, electrical nanopore uh, sequencing uh, platform, we have single base resolution uh, since the exonuclease uh, releases one base at a time. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a base per second on average, you can see that uh, here it's roughly 100 uh, nucleotides in length or 80 nucleotides in length, uh, this template. So we digest one base at a time and uh, the signal to noise is fairly, fairly good. So we have fairly high uh, accuracy, you know, for single molecules, it's about 90% at this, at this point. Um, so this is how the the DNA sequencing works. So then very quickly before I run out of time, uh, we then realized that we can use the very same uh, technology uh, to um, uh, identify, not, not sequence the proteins, uh, we call it protein fingerprinting, uh, by labeling certain amino acids with a fluorescent uh, dye. And this is how we how we do it. We, we take a protein of interest or a mix of proteins for that matter, uh, we denature uh, the proteins completely using SDS heat, uh, a reducing agent like DDT, 
making it a completely linear chain of amino acids. Uh, and then we um, fluorescently labeled certain amino acids, uh, for instance, uh, lysines, uh, cysteines, uh, methionines, tyrosines are relatively easy targets for very specific attachment of, of fluorophores to those amino acids or the side groups of those amino acids. Um, and then we also uh, attach a biotin uh, specifically to the N terminus, and we use that to attach uh, the labeled denatured uh, proteins uh, to, the, to the very same nanoparticles that we use for DNA sequencing. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we use uh, the very same nanopore chip uh, with the same metal layers, the same uh, sequencer uh, using a, a laser illumination. Um, we have, we then uh, pull the nanoparticles with the uh, labeled proteins attached into the uh, nanopore chip. Instead of the exonuclease, we use an exopeptidase uh, in the trans chamber. Uh, and then we, as soon as the protein gets uh, inserted into the nanopore, uh, the exopeptidase starts digesting uh, the, the protein, releasing the amino acids uh, and the labeled amino acids we detect, similar to the uh, DNA sequencing uh, in the, as they exit uh, the nanopore. So uh, right now we have um, three amino acids uh, labeled shown here. Uh, we don't detect, again, the unlabeled uh, amino acids shown here in black. Uh, but we get a barcode or a fingerprint of, of a certain protein. And then we use that to uh, compare it to uh, a reference sequence uh, in a database that allows us to uh, identify which protein we just, uh, uh, which protein we digested. And uh, since it's single molecule, it's obviously a quantitative uh, approach. We can tell how many uh, or how much of a protein is present uh, in a sample uh, using this approach. Um, so we did a little bit of um, bioinformatics behind the whole uh, protein detection system, just to see whether our, our, our platform would be able to, or how much of the whole protein we would be able to detect in a, in a single run that that's shown uh, here. Uh, we took, uh, you know, the average human uh, proteome, um, and with a uh, hundred thousand nanopores, which we can, you know, put on one on one uh, uh, chip uh, and illuminate uh, simultaneously uh, by uh, depleting the most uh, abundant proteins uh, shown here, up to a hundred uh, um, of the most abundant proteins. With running, you're doing 50 million uh, reads, we can get up to somewhere between you know 80 to uh, 90 percent uh, uh, coverage of the of the human human proteome, and that allows us uh, you know with a fairly high uh, dynamic range uh, to also detect the the lower bond proteins in a sample, and obviously more of those uh, if we if we uh, remove the, the most abundant proteins uh, through filtration uh, in the beginning. And hey, Martin, just to yeah. time check, I think we're almost there within about a minute. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm almost almost done. So we're, this, this is just uh, we started building our system that the cartridge holds that nanopore chip. Uh, we uh, use standard nanofabrication processes to, you know, wafer scale processes to uh, generate our uh, nanopore chip. Uh, we've built a software that runs all the components of the instrument, but also does the analysis. Uh, we use machine learning to uh, identify the signals uh, as, as, the, as the amino acids or nucleotides are coming out of the nanopore, and we will uh, you know, offer some um, uh, sample preparation uh, reagents. I think I talked about all the other things, and with that, I can answer any questions if there are any. Great, thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, any questions for Martin? Saraf, go for it. So when when you're detecting individual uh, amino acids or nucleotides, uh, I'm presuming you're using software to build the full-length molecules. So do you anticipate 
facing challenges with isoforms or uh, homomeric repeats uh, uh, associated proteins or, or, or uh, single molecule RNAs? Uh, homopolymers, sorry, did I understand? Uh, so, so the ho homopolymers are no problem uh, because the, uh, uh, on the, on, again, we just did DNA uh, sequencing, so I can't really talk to RNA sequencing, but you could imagine if you had the polymerase that can copy an RNA, so an RT, uh, we could potentially directly sequence uh, RNA. Uh, but the exonuclease in the actual sequencing reaction uh, digests one, uh, uh, base at a time, right? So any homopolymer, so we, we never observe any issues with a homopolymer or, or an increased, uh, you know, uh, error rate uh, based on a homopolymer. So a quick follow-up, Martin, um, you're using <clears throat> solid state nanopores, right? Correct. So these are silicon-based nanopores or what are these? Um, yeah, there is, there is multiple layers. So yes, it's a silicon, silicon nitride. Uh, then we have uh, uh, certain other layers for you know adhesion and all kinds of you know from from a nanofabrication perspective, and then we have a thick metal layer uh, that we that basically prevents uh, the laser light of of penetrating through. Think of it as an upside down zero mode waveguide, if you will. Uh, the laser light cannot penetrate through the nanopore, uh, which is you know crucial because it does it does. Uh, prevent any uh, photo bleaching uh, while the DNA or the protein sits inside the nanopore. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, what's the for, uh, shelf life and reusability of these pores? Because the issue with uh, biological nanopores is, uh, once you are exposing them to current, they get degraded, right? Twenty-four to forty-eight hours or thereafter. So, I'm curious about the shelf life and reusability. Um, so shelf life, we've used chips that are years old, uh, and they perform just fine. Um, and we have done runs, uh, 48 uh, hours with, you know, no increase in, in, in current. So the, the, the pores don't, uh, you know, increase in, in size or anything. So we, we don't see much of a, dig so we haven't gone beyond that, but you know, that's pretty a 48 hour run is, is probably we won't go longer than that anyway. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, Brenda. So I'm also, um, I'm going to ask you to extrapolate to RNA, which is maybe not fair, but uh, um, you can pass if you want. But I guess I'm thinking of methods that in, for RNA that involve exonucleases to cleave off each base. And it seems to me that, you know, especially if you have modifications, you have a two prime O methyl, you're going to have a problem sort of with getting the exonuclease to work the same way on every modification. And I just wondered if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, uh, you're probably right. Uh, that would be my first thought that, uh, you know, with uh, modifications on, on RNA uh, that an exonuclease would have probably you know, would react differently. Let's put it this way. Again, we haven't done any 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 work with RNA, so that's why I'm really just speculating here. Uh, but I would I would expect it to behave somewhat differently. However, I mean, so the way we would let me just very very quickly jump back here to the um, to the one slide where you know we did a. So, you know, the way we, we would envision RNA sequencing if, instead of DNA, right, using, having here an RNA with potentially some modifications to the RNA, and then we would still need to somehow, you know, incorporate those labeled nucleotides, right? So we would basically, you know, convert the RNA into a cDNA mm -hmm. or a hybrid RNA cDNA uh, molecule where the cDNA is, is modified. And... Mm -hmm. You know, for that we would need a, a, a specialized, you know, polymerase, right? Uh, an RT uh, polymerase, reverse transcriptase, um, and I'm not even sure if if that polymerase could actually recognize specific RNA modifications and and transfer that into the cDNA. Uh, so that might be another, you know, challenge uh, yeah. for 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 RNA sequencing. Um, but then. The exonuclease at that point would, would digest right the the labor the cDNA and so right yep my, and so yeah that's a good point you, you but you would have to have some way of the 
uh, the new cDNA strand being able to read out a different modification. And so, yes. Uh, thank you. That was really helpful. Yeah, um, that's perfect. We, uh, we're right at 20 minutes. Um, so thank you, Martin. Um, we're going to uh, turn it over to Sammy Jaffrey. Uh, he's, a, he's a professor at Weill Cornell Medical College and founder of Gotham Therapeutics. Uh, and an advisor at 858 Therapeutics, which has recently acquired Gotham. Right, thank you very much. Um, so, um, you know, and I just wanted to mention that, you know, when I'm speaking today, I'm, I'm speaking as a, um, uh, for my university position, I'm not speaking as a representative of any of the companies that, you know, I've been involved in, but I'm gonna tell you today about our work on, um, uh, um, whoops, sorry wrong timer. I'm going to tell you uh, just just my experience working with companies that want to drug the epitranscriptome, why they want to do it, what the challenges are that we're facing in terms of uh, uh, drugging the epitranscriptome. And, you know, I think why why were people interested in this? You know, we were first approached in 2016, you know, after we did the original map of M6A at, uh, at, at relatively low resolution in 2012 and then single nucleotide maps in 2015. Um, many companies approached me, and I think the column and and 2016, I said, you know, why we don't we all we know is maps, we don't know what it's doing, but their their idea was this is the new epigenetics, and we want to get in early. So the column group and Versant Ventures, I think I was involved with both of them in the starting of Accent and then the starting of Gotham, Gotham Therapeutics. But I left the column group to join uh, Versant to do uh, Gotham uh, Therapeutics, which was then acquired by 858 to broaden the RNA portfolio. Um, but it's, uh, it was a very lucrative, lots of money was raised in the Series A without that much of an understanding about what these modifications were actually doing. But the idea was, or at least the pitches that these companies were giving, is that there is a whole universe of modifications out there. M5C, pseudouridine, M1A, 2 primo methyls, all these other things in mRNAs, and each one, just like every histone modification, could have unique function. We now, and, and a lot of these were also in big, huge, high-profile papers. You know, our original M6A map was in Cell, but um, all these other things were also in big journals as well. But we now know that most of these things were just artifacts, and at least 99% of the map sites for almost all of these other modifications, especially M1A, 2 prima methyl M7G, and maybe AC4C, a settle or C was, was an artifact. But nonetheless, it at the time created a very different perspective of what you could target, which was every different modification would cause every every different function. But we now know that a lot of them are not real. And, and why why aren't they real? A lot of them were very simple errors. I mean, the, I think the three most well-known problems are that 2 primo methyl, which was, uh, you know, we and others showed that that they were mapping their reverse transcriptase primer. The M1A modification, which was in nature, we, we and the Schwartz group showed that the antibody was not specific. The M7G, Schwartz has argued, this is a great review on the problem with the mapping of these modifications and the errors that they've all been about, but they showed that it's the Illumina sequencing errors at the ends of reads. The problem is that people did not use uh, biochemical validation, especially the method that Tao Pan innovated called Scarlet, which we use all the time and other labs have used, but none of these papers and none of the reviewers or the journals really required it. But, you know, the thing, the, the ultimate thing is, regardless of whether, um, uh, and, and I should say, we've also done other methods to see if there's other modifications. We've, we, we, we've done these global analysis of huge amounts of sequencing reads to see if there are recurrent mismatch errors at specific locations in the in the genome relative to the DNA, because that can indicate the presence of a mutation. A lot of mutations will cause, a lot of modifications will cause mutations or in reverse transcription. There's a lot of sequencing errors, but if a specific site shows errors over and over again across different replicates, and we screened 3 million nucleotides, and we only find five sites which are showing um, mismatch errors during reverse transcription. One of those turns out to be M1A. So there's very, very few modifications outside of M6A. M6A does not introduce a sequencing error. But the thing is, even though there's been a lot of evidence showing that these modifications don't exist, um, that they've been large, that they're largely art artifacts. The VC people are still so excited by it. And so it's uh, even now, even after the initial fundraise, I still get accosted by venture capital people about targeting these different modifications. And even this, this was also like an example of something that was written in Nature Genetics, a call for these modifications. But yes, one person 
said to me, who's in the field said, you know, why are, this is like saying we want to study unicorns and leprechauns. These things don't exist in, in, in RNAs, these modifications. So there's no real need to really map them if they don't exist or if they exist in very, 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 very low uh, frequencies or abundances. So the diverse mRNA tra epitranscriptome doesn't exist. It's really M6A and a few others. I think we can, I, I basically put the modifications in three different buckets. So uh, one bucket is the real and the abundant modifications, M6A, the cap methyl, the, the two primo methyls at the first two positions in RNA, and that N6 methyl at the first position. So these are the abundant ones that were all discovered in the 1970s. But then there's some rare ones that exist, like pseudouridine, maybe 100, M5C, maybe 200, um, M1A, one or two. And then there's others that are not validated and are probably artifacts or are also super rare. And so the thing is there, there isn't really a diverse epitranscriptome, it's really M6A. And um, there's cap, all these cap methyls and, and we've, we, we mapped the M6AM in 2015 and we just published the cap methylation map a few months ago. So I think those things are, are it. There aren't really anything else to map at least um, in, in, in a reasonable number, they're just super rare examples. So that's why we have a focus on M6A. Um, and that's why these companies, all the companies I think are pretty much focusing on M6A is because it's the only one that's really there. Um, and uh, M6A also has a clear effect, uh, mRNA degradation. Specific RNAs are also modified with M6A, which are cell fate and differentiation genes. And so you know, if you wanna modulate cell fate, which is important in cancer, um, that's a great thing to target because you can you can target a coordinated set of genes that are all related in a single pathway. And there's even some patient data. There's some mutations in some of the uh, pathway proteins as well as um, overexpression of metal three and certain certain leukemias. So there's a reason to believe that M6A would be very good. On the other hand, pseudouridine and M5C, which do exist in very low numbers, even after all these years, there's no clear and consistent effect on what they do. There's no clear reader. Um, and what I think you're going to find is that every pseudouridine that you might find has its own unique story, like this pseudouridine may affect uh, binding of protein X, and this one might affect translation, and this one might affect stability. Each one will be different, but there's no general principle like you have with M6A. Now, it might be different in viruses. There's some interesting uh, evidence for modifications in viruses that are robust, but in, in mRNAs, it's... it's it's not really a clear thing. So that's why I don't think, you know, I or anybody recommends going after these modifications. M6AM and CAP2 methylation, these CAP modifications, um, you know, even though I love these because we map them, um, it's not really clear what the disease links are either. And it's still early days, but um, I'm not really sure if there's a valid reason to go after those modifications as well. So it's just M6A. But then the question is, the companies are all talking about, what do we go after? Re and the, the, the thing is that there were so many readers, writers, and erasers, the idea is that you might be able to select any of these and select and, and microsurgically dissect the M6A pathway. But a lot of this has turned out not to be valid either. Um, I think, you know, the idea that there, you know, in terms, let me just go back here. What, I, what I'm showing you on the readers is that these YTHDF proteins um, are, are were all different readers. And the idea sort of was indicated at the bottom that each of these YTHDF proteins targets a different M6A and that they do different things. And, and I'm showing you some clip data where people are looking at the binding sites in the top row of YTHDF1, the bottom site of YTHDF2. And you know, you could see, look how different they are. You could go after, we can make drugs that target each one of these, but these all have turned out to be um, mostly artifacts as well. I think a group out of Duke showed that the uh, YTH clip data that had been used, the reads were only six nucleotides in length. And so you can't map them in a single way. So we redid the clip analysis and we were trying to see based on the peak heights, we took every every dot on the right is an M6A site. And we took the peak height for YTHDF1 and the peak height for YTHDF2. And we said, are there any M6A sites that are preferentially binding to one or binding to the other? The answer is no, they all bind equally. And we showed that all of these sites bind equally. You know, this paper I think was probably the big paper that really demonstrated this idea that the, that the different readers do different things and that the YTHDF1, which is what this paper was about, does um, translation. But there was simple errors in these experiments. And so I'm just showing you the, the ribosome profiling and th which this paper was based on. They were doing knockdown of YTHDF1, and you can see the number of reads for every gene. Um, and you, the reads should not change except for YTHDF1, which is what happened. But in their second replicate, it looks normal, except 
the YTHDF1 was actually massively overexpressed. So they didn't do a knockdown, they did an overexpression, and this sort of created an artifact uh, in terms of our understanding of YTHDF1 because of the way this was done. So we redid all of this work, and the conclusion was in our, in our paper in 2020 that all the YTHDF proteins are the same, they bind all the same mRNAs, they do the same function, and there's no argument to make isoform specific inhibitors. So that I think this paper, our, our, our paper really ended this idea that we should drug them separately because they all are basically doing the same thing. And this work has been now replicated by Jacob Hanna's group, other groups. So, you know, this is ki a kind of well accepted. There might be some differences, but they all do degradation. Um, so but anyway, so we now have a very, very different view, at least the drug industry has a very different view of the M6A pathway. One writer, which is turns out to be the metal three, metal 14 heterodimer, the claims that metal 14 was a was a separate enzyme was due to contamination um, in the way they did their preparation. One major reader, the YTHDF proteins, their paralogs are almost identical. They do almost the same thing. A lot of the other proteins, you know, they've now reported crystal structures. They don't actually bind M6A. Um, and one eraser, FTO had been argued to be the M6A eraser. We showed that in fact, it doesn't even act on M6A in cells, it acts on um, SNRNA, but there's still some debate about this. I think different people have different views, but I think we're gonna come to a resolution on this very soon. ALKBH5 is a true M6A eraser and it's in testes, it's not really clear if it has roles outside of testes, but there isn't really the universe of so many targets to go after. The M6A pathway turned out to be very, very, very narrow. And so it's very different from how, when the initial fundraising happened to as science developed, we now just know if you want to target M6A, you can target the, the readers. But, it, it, the, but then I think, you know, the, there's such a big issue of like, we want to get rid of M6A in MIC, or you want to get M6A in P53. But we now know core ideas that were present early on are not really um, uh, correct. So first, all M6A sites in the transcriptome, essentially every single one is mediated by this metal three enzyme. So you can't target one set of enzyme, one set of M6A sites by targeting one pathway or another. Any inhibitor targets all of them, and all of the sites do the same thing. So you know you can't target any individual YTHDF protein because they all function to mediate the same property, which is degrading all RNAs that had M6As, at least M6As in high abundance. And then the other thing is that there's no demethylation by FTO and. I think the Schwartz group did FTO knockouts. Uh, Shugo did FTO knockouts. So there's a lot of, and there's, and we analyze this ourselves, but the methods I'm giving you are quantitative methods. No, no real change in M6A sites. As there's a paper that argues that maybe it's in retrotransposons, not in regular mRNAs, but at least in mRNAs, there doesn't seem to be any effective demethylation. No tissue specific M6A. And so this, and you know, a, a really great experiment in, in, in some of these papers has been to compare different tissues, very different tissues, differentiated and undifferentiated stem cells. And they look at the M6A stoichiometry at every site and it's the same. And so this is why I tell people, and it, you know, we, we invented M6A mapping, but I tell them, don't waste your time mapping M6A. It's a universal code, and you can look at any one data set, and it will tell you um, if your M6A is modified into the exact percentage. And I think the, the um, real thing, you know, we argued this in molecular cell in 2022, but now some papers in molecular cell and science have now more or less proven this, that the M6A is hardwired by the genomic architecture large internal exons are what recruits the methyl transferase. And it's because the exon junction, at least according to some of these papers, the exon, and this is not our work, this is the work of other groups, the exon junction complex hides a lot of the RNA from methylation and only the accessible sites can be methylated. And that's gonna be true in a liver or a T cell or a brain because they all same, same, have the same genomic architecture, which is why M6A sites are universal and unchanging and pretty much identical in pretty much every tissue um, because they all have the same genomic architecture. Um, so where did this idea that M6A is dynamic come from? Why do we even have this idea? Well, it's because of um, the way that people have incorrectly done their M6A calling. So if, if the top row in purple is, an, is, a, is, a, is a mirip -seq map where you get, mirip -seq is the method for mapping M6A sites and you get peaks on the genome, you can say, oh, and you have a threshold and a dotted line, you can say the first two peaks are called M6A sites, but not the third one. And then in the cancer, you might say, 
oh, oh, the second one is not called, but the first and third one are. And then you'll call the second one as a unique site that's lost in cancer. And the third one as a unique site that's gained in cancer. But that is absolutely the wrong way to do bioinformatic analysis. You shouldn't be saying a site's there or not there. You should, you should basically compare them. So these Venn diagrams that people have used have really misled the people into believing that there's cancer-specific epitranscriptomes when there's absolutely not. And we've talked about this, and, and I think this paper really talks about how the, the peak maps are so noisy, and you can't be doing this type of analysis. And pretty much all the work in this field, and I'm sorry to say it, all the work in the field has been using the incorrect uh, way of, of comparing the sites. But let me just tell you, all of these problems have now been solved. Uh, this is work by two groups or two sets of groups, all in Nature Biotechnology late last year. We now have quantitative mapping of M6A. Um, it's a, these methods basically deaminate A into inosine, but they don't deaminate M6A. And so you can just see any adenosines that remain in your sequencing reads are M6A. And this is just an example where adenosines are in orange. And the only place where you see any adenosines in your reads was at the M6A site. And the difference between the two methods is Glory does it through a chemical reaction. ETMC uses an enzyme to deaminate all the adenosines. But the key thing I just want to say, they've done their quantitative analysis and they compare, for instance, stem cells with fibroblasts completely different cell types. M6A stoichiometry, identical at every single site. So are basically identical at 99% of the sites, I should say. And the other sites are probably just because of low read coverage. So this just shows that we now can get exact stoichiometries and this is the, the method. So when, when I deal with a biotech, you know, the key conclusions are from these works is that any metal free inhibitor will target all of them. There's no disease specific M6A FB transcriptome. It's the same as a normal FB transcriptome. There's no evidence for one RNA like MYC being 10 times more methylated than any other cell type, um, or at least the evidence is, is, is very, very flawed. And so the focus of targeting M6A should be when you want to target the entire M6A cohort. So the thing is, well, I think one of the things that we deal with is the FDA wants a biomarker when we make the metal free inhibitors. So that's what people have all agreed. Okay, I'm, I'll wrap up in, in, I think, in one or two slides. Um, they want biomarkers, and the, the, there are enzymes that cut M6A um, modified transcripts, and you can do QPTR. This is using the MAZF enzyme. But the key thing that I emphasize, people are not very happy with what I say uh, because they, they know that FDA won't like it. Any M6A site can be measured. You can measure M6A levels in actin. And if they go down when you treat your animal with the inhibitor, then you've inhibited the enzyme. All M6A sites are identical. You can test any one of them, but they do prefer to use disease-relevant biomarkers. And you know, we were brought on to help people do mapping in these companies, but there's no need to do mapping with the metal 3 inhibitor. All sites are affected. So the prospects, I think the major gap that we have is how do you, and it's not really technology, it's science. How do you know which patient is going to respond to metal 3 inhibitor and which one won't? For mRNA, I think the future involves the, the, the real abundant modifications, but M6A is the only one that's disease linked. The real untapped area, area is tRNA modifications, a lot more dynamics in the modifications, a lot of potential links to uh, disease, especially Richard Gregory has shown some of this. Our RNA modifications could potentially um, be interesting in regulating specific targets of our of translation, and they may be disease relevant, and snow RNAs guide those modifications. But we really need evidence that these modifications are driving the disease. All right, so just this, these are my acknowledgments, and I can take any questions. Great. Thank you, Sammy. So, uh, oops, sorry, I lost my camera, but I'm still here. There we go. Yep, I'm, I can uh, Okay, I can I'm, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Um, mm -hmm. And, but uh, maybe, are, are you able to give us a little bit of uh, tell us a little bit about Gotham. I know that at the beginning you said you didn't represent Gotham, but given your, you know, insights, is there anything you can say about uh, how what the work they're doing fits into uh, what you just talked about? Yeah, so I can talk about what they publicly disclosed. And the key thing is, you know, again, they were trying to figure out a good target and the answer is metal 3. That's what they decided to go after. And the YTHDF proteins are something to consider, but they don't have really good druggable pockets. So even if you could get an inhibitor that inhibited all the YTHDF proteins, they just don't have the right features for druggability. So metal 3, which uses s methionine, has a pocket right there. And there's a long history of, of drugging these enzymes. And so the main focus of Goth them was to target metal three, but when we were acquired by 858, we have a broader RNA portfolio. And so we're targeting other RNA biology. I don't want to say RNA modifications um, 
beyond because I, 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 I just I want to be general because I can't reveal any of the programs that they have other than the ones that they publicly announced. But they're going after RNA biology and it fit in very nicely. It was very synergistic with a lot of the other expertise that they have. So they're making inhibitors that we're going to be in clinic, I think, at the end of this year, or at least we'll have the uh, uh, IND um, at the submit at the end of the year or, or early 2023, um, uh, 2024, I mean, but um, we're, we're, and we're closely following the great work from Storm Therapeutics, which is all, which is already described in metal three inhibitor, and they're already in phase one trials. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for answering that. And then, so, so Byron, um, I'm going to prioritize Brenda, no, not uh, f f anything against you. Your questions are great, but uh, just to get the, the committee question in, and then uh, we'll see if we have time for yours. <laughs> I'm not sure I like that, but um, anyway, um, so so Sammy, um, in the methods that have been used to map M6A, uh, I, I guess I thought they were mostly ensemble, you know, that you're not getting end to end for single messenger RNAs. And I, you know, when you say they're all the same, maybe, maybe that's right. But if it wasn't all end to end, you would not be getting uh, ex um, uh, diversity in where the mod modifications are. And then finally, I will just say, of course, inestine in messenger RNA has been linked to disease. So... <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry. You know, you know how it is in the epitranscriptomics field. We all kind of ignore inosine and eight I editing. Yet that was actually first. You know what I mean? That was actually uh, well before any of this stuff. Um, I do know what you mean. Yeah. Um, so it's, let me just say, Brenda's absolutely right. So if you see using some of these methods that it's 50% M6A, it could be that at, 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 at five sites, let's say there's five M6A sites and they're all 50% stoichiometry. It could be that among 100 transcripts, at every site, it could be randomly yes, no, yes, no, 50%. Or it could be half the transcripts have all have M6A at all the sites and half have M6A at um, none of the sites. The ETAM seek people who use an enzyme and there's no RNA fragmentation are doing long read sequencing and we're doing it as well. So I think that will soon be resolved where you'll be able to look at individual RNAs and you'll be able to just see if you get transcription of RNAs, which are completely M6A free, and then sometimes you get transcription with M6A full, or if it's all stochastic and somewhat random to achieve the final concentration. But uh, it's, 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 it's basically, I mean, wait a year, you'll, you'll get all that information. It's, it, I mean, the, these methods are revolutionary. I wish we developed it. We, we actually were thinking about it a lot, but um, but then there was a surge of deaminase enzymes for CRISPR base editing, and these people used that. And so um, we, I should have restarted that program in our lab. But that, that's a great, great, great method. And the chemical method's pretty good too. It fragments the RNAs, so you get small reads. But if you want long reads, the ETAM seq is the way to do it. But you know, the key thing is no more mysteries. Well, I yeah, I will let other people ask questions. I I'm, I I got your point and and your um you know your you put it forth very well. I guess I'm not sure everybody would agree that um it's all the same. But well, we let, let me just say this. I think the problem that we have is that so many people have written papers arguing for diversity and dynamics that it's 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 hard to say that you know all of this stuff is wrong. And you know, my colleague Chris Mason, who wrote this paper, we were part of it, but you know, he basically listed every single paper and showed how they were wrong. And I, I told Chris, you're never going to get this into Nature Biotechnology, and it kept on getting rejected because I think it it was being reviewed by people whose work he was showing was incorrect. But I think the 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 reason, Brenda, why I think it's going to be solved is because mm -hmm. the data is so on is so unambiguous when you use these methods. You can't fight about it anymore. There's no more like, well, I saw a peak change or I didn't see a peak change. You get an absolute percentage. And so I think this will allow us to answer all of those questions. And I think the data will be hard to d deny. These, d these papers, they're not mine, but they're really, really good. Hey. Um. I have a lot of questions that they'll take way too long. And I'm also really hoping that we can give Byron a chance to ask his question. Um, but so I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the tasks of the committee and thinking about, um, you know, sequencing of RNA modifications. And obviously your your opinion is, is clear of, of which ones to go after. 
so thinking about even just M6A, <clears throat> you know, you're making the argument that everything's kind of the same, yet there is evidence that M6A can have specific functions on the processing of transcripts that are different from RNA to RNA. And obviously perturbing M6A can have different physiological effects in different cell types, et cetera, et cetera. I wonder if maybe we can just hear your thoughts on, you know, the advantages of, of an effort like this, i.e., you know, um, direct sequencing of, of abundant chemical modifications like, like M6A. You know, what, what's the value if, if we're to think that everything's the same and it doesn't matter, we could just sequence one RNA's M6A to know what's changing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I, I always tell people, do not waste your money and sequence M6A. It is a waste of time because every M6A site that we have found that, that we mapped in our single nucleotide resolution map comes up in every other person's data set. The only difference is that different people use different thresholds and then they call a site more or less and it's related to RNA abundance and other types of technical things. These assays over here will solve that, right? But again, they've already provided uh, the ETAM seq had many different mouse tissues. The Glory has different sites, I, and human and mouse. I mean, I don't really think there's any need to do it except to resolve the re residual controversies. I think Brenda's point about looking at them in single molecules is the is the only remaining question that we have. I think what you're going to find is that, and this is what we found, we we find that M6A levels globally go up or globally go down a few percent, maybe 10%, 20%, depending if the degradation pathway for M6A RNAs is more or less uh, active, but that's it. Um, but it's not like there's different patterns of, of, of writing. Um, also, I think in terms of M6As having different functions, there's a, you know, a Neil Brockdorf had a great paper on M6A and splicing, and he used a chemical inhibitor before they were available and showed that it was only like three or four mRNAs, but they had dramatic splicing changes. But in general, M6As are going to be linked to uh, one thing, instability. There are effects on translation, but they're always indirect, right? Because M6A can influence the expression of translational regulators and, and other factors, and then you can get changes in translation. I, I don't think, especially now that we've got chemical inhibitors, and this is what Neil Brockdorf, you know, Neil Brockdorf's paper was like, look, when you knock at metal three, the cells are differentiating. And then when you look at splicing changes, it could be because you have a different cell type, not because you inhibited M6A. I think now that we've got the chemical inhibitors and we can acutely measure what's happening like is there a different splicing effect is there a difference in some other aspect of biology we're going to see there isn't that much there's going to be a few unique circumstances but it's broadly one one function i think it's going to be degradation um and i mean and that's what you see globally, right? Global effect of degradation. I mean, and uh, let me just say, Kate, there won't, I'm, I'm not saying that there won't be one-off papers, like in this mRNA, the M6A is positioned in a way that blocks protein X or it does something. But as in terms of a general function, that's what M6A does. It's like microRNAs, you know, micro, some microRNAs actually turn on mRNA stability and some microRNAs compete with proteins and you get a, you can get a paper in molecular cell showing this microRNA does this thing on this, this mRNA, but the broad function of microRNAs is to mediate degradation. All right, so I'm gonna cut in. <clears throat> we have about 41 minutes left for two more speakers. So I think that works out well for us. We're gonna cut off the questions, but I did see that Byron asked a question in the chat um, and uh, you can answer that while he's given his talk. So I'm going to turn it over to Byron. Uh, he's the director of RNA analytics at Storm Therapeutics. Hi, Nick. Uh, yeah, and I don't have any slides, so sorry. That's, yeah, uh, that's fine. Yeah, uh, this is, I'll just talk and um, I, I invite questions as I go because there's nothing for you to interrupt. There's just my flow of consciousness, as it were. But yeah, we'll try and stick to time. So, so quick, uh, Byron, that, that sounds great. I just, mm. uh, let me just interject. If if you can mute your mic, I think there's some background, not not you, Byron, but others. <laughs> if you can remember to <laughs> mute your mic, uh, it might help us uh, hear what Byron has to say. It's more likely some people having a lovely time near me, but uh, yeah, I'll do my best. Um, so I'll just quickly refer to Storm Therapeutics and a few numbers. Um, we're 35 people in Cambridge, UK, founded seven years ago in 2016. We published about 25 papers. We raised $85 million of venture capital, and we have one candidate drug in the clinic, which is STC15 and methyl 3 inhibitor. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's that really. Um, I can't hear you, Byron. You can't hear me. We can't hear you. Oh, uh, it, it came through 
It came through okay for me. Is anybody else having a problem? I can hear it. Okay. Sorry, Brenda. I guess I guess you're out. Oh, I'll shout. Background. Can other people hear Byron? I, I yes. can I can hear, oh, okay. uh, but there is a, a back, background uh, conversation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll just move away from them. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> let's see if that works. So yeah, right. Okay, let's give this a go. Face away from them uh, rudely. So yeah, yeah. So in general, storm. We've got a metal three inhibitor. That's that's not really what this is about. I could talk a little bit about my experience. Again, this is not really what it's about. It's very interesting to follow Sammy and uh, and a lot of assertions and things that I really enjoy about M6A and, and Metal 3 in general. I would say there's M6A. There's a huge amount of work that's been focused in on that for technical reasons. And I think quite a lot of what Sammy says is, is correct, essentially. I don't agree with all of it. I'm nervous of simple solutions to... Uh, complicated things. I don't think that every M6A is the same, but uh, but yeah, maybe we can get into that in questions and debate. But uh, I would say what is probably as important is to try and characterize and work out what you're talking about with the M6A. There's sites which are consistent. There's sites which are stochastic, as is, uh, this is my belief. Uh, this comes from the various studies we've done of all the different kinds of sequencing technologies. We've got about eight people in the group. We used to sequence by mass spec. We used nucleoside mass spec internally as well. Uh, we did some nanopore stuff, uh, did, did all sorts of various sequencing things. For us, I think I would agree that the main place of effort to go for what, what has like the, the highest return on interest for understanding the diversity of the RNA mods is probably in some other forms of RNA than the messenger RNA. So I think for, for the messenger RNA mods, whether you agree or disagree on the, uh, the spread or the occupancy or the, uh, the, the, the reality of them, I would say that working out what happens downstream of them is almost the more compelling thing that will take a really long time to work out. That's just time and it's a lot of effort. I'm not sure it's something that can be short circuited that easily. I think that's just a very long time and much research from a lot of people. I think understanding the diversity of the modification profile on ribosomes and on tRNA and how that differs across diverse biological settings might be something where sequencing the modifications may be more immediately helpful. They might provide answers rather than just more questions. So that's, uh, that is, I guess, my view of it. Um, happy to take any sort of debates and, and uh, questions on that as we go. But uh, I would say as well as the mass spec, the RNA sequencing, the cell biology, this, uh, this various stuff that I lead, I lead at Storm. I also direct our ADAR1 drug discovery program, which uh, I work on with X Alexis. Uh, there are lovely collaborators in, in San Francisco. And what I would say there is that quite a lot of the learnings that we've, we've, we've seen from, from the inner scene is that we can, we can treat some of these things, some of the consistent inner scene sites, the ones that everyone's interested in, and your alley repeats and what have you. Treating them as simple self, non-self markers goes quite a long way towards what you end up then understanding about what happens as consequences of messing around with them. I think there's some similarities between M6A and inosine, is it self, non-self markers uh, when treated ensemble in the system. But does sequencing them help you to understand that or need to treat them all on mass as some kind of mass pharmacodynamic biomarker? I mean, uh, that, that's most of what we do. Um, I'm just talking now, so yeah, <laughs> no, but, but, it, but like, what I would say is, um, I'm going to circle back on the, the M6A thing, because this is fun, because there's so, so much opinion from Sammy, so, so much to, to chat about with it, it's great, but I guess uh, to give my personal takes and feelings on it, we did nanopore sequencing, right? we did loads of it, we did it industrially, because like we can, um, and you get some sites that pop up all the time, everywhere, every, you know, every, every experiment that you look at, but not always. And uh, with the sort of algorithms we were using at the time, we were using safe but boring ones that were working off the biophysics, not doing anything particularly clever or neural networky. Uh, so we were working with like 400 sites that we could always, always, always see. And these were antibody free. Uh, they're limited by sensitivity because you need at least 100 reads going through each biological nanopore to get there. It's all slow. Sometimes the chips die and it's really boring. But 
in general, we, we ended up with the idea that we could, we could do clever things with the data and we could get 100,000 sites back with extremely low occupancy. We could do these less clever things and we could get these 400 sites so we could track through space and time and whatever. Um, and I think that they behave, that they exist for different purposes, but we, we can't really match the assertions. We can't mutate them all. And I think it's something for M6A in particular. Very few people go after the mods for mutation studies afterwards because you know, it's, it's fearsome, it's threatening, it's horrible. A paper that really affected me is uh, it's written by someone on, online. I think it's, uh, Kate's written loads of papers that I like, but uh, I was really struck by the single cell dart seat paper for the idea that, and I find it very appealing, the idea that Metal 3 with the short degenerate motif has no st structural components to it. I mean, like who's ever heard of a motif? That isn't made out of canonical nucleotides <laughs> it has that sort of slack in it so the idea of like the exome junction complex getting in the way and the m6a kind of just being deposited wherever this enzyme happens to be with this relatively misunderstood writer complex and loads of different bits to it as well i think the idea that there's a huge amount of stochastic noise that we couldn't see with a nanopore sequencer because that's not within the remits of the technique uh and, but the, that that M6A still matters is something which we've struggled with and we think about quite a lot. The point of where I'm sort of marching with this, I guess, is if you were to try and sequence all of the epitranscriptome, you're going to try and find modifications that matter. Do you need to do single cell M6A seq to try and find the level of information that's in there? Uh, or, or is that kind of impossible? Are you constrained to those constant M6A sites that, uh, that are few and for probably reasons of genomic and transcriptomic architecture are always in the same place? Or for M6A in particular, is the challenge more about working out what happens ensemble to removing them? So, I think decoding the specific M6A locations is something which you can rationalize is really hard. Um, I think other techniques that validate the single cell dart seek, if, if, if they exist, would be required for that. Uh, I don't know what they are. Um, I think that the place where you might get more answers to reverberate my own point is to say, if we're looking at specialized ribosomes or something like this, some of the Maria Barna work, which, uh, which I also find really exciting. Can you say why some ribosomes are different to others? Can you look at the code on usage stuff that comes out of that? Can you sort of explain why something that's thought to be homogenous, but actually isn't, uh, I think there's more value there immediately, but whether those techniques are as amenable to some of, uh, some of what we were hearing about earlier on, I'm not sure. But, uh, uh, that's probably talked about 40% of the stuff I was talking about. Half the people can't hear me, but I uh, will willingly accept <laughs> any questions on that at all. And maybe I can shout a bit louder. No, so. Thank you, Byron. I, I think it came through clearly. Um, and Brenda does have a question. Okay. <laughs> so um, I realized that I really don't know um, where M6A is outside of mammals and i wonder if you could remind me if uh i think i remember drosophila but c elegans you know how deep does m6a go in messenger rnas and is there has anybody looked to see if it's the same uh between mammals and other animals what wonderful question and i think i used to know this really well about five years ago when at the time when all vcs were saying are you going to be able to stratify patients by understanding their m6a locations and uh, i still get asked that question and now i just say no it's not that easy <laughs> sadly but i think yeah there is an equivalent to metal 3 in c elegans uh i believe there's an equivalent to metal 14 as well as it sort of has this you know, obligate heterodyme relationship i don't know about all the other your Vermas, your WTAPs, your RB, RBM15s, these other components. So I don't know how conserved the whole complicated com complex is, um, but I do know that the main place where people have really understood what M6A is doing in any sort of dynamic way, I think is yeast really, but um, I think there's been these studies where they show it going up and down at different points of the cell cycle, but it's not stuff that I look at that much as a drug discoverer, I have to say. Yeah, so that's a good point. Looking for the the where the enzymes are, the readers, writers is a good way to look. And and maybe there's not as much sequencing information for other other organisms. But I will I will let Juan go on. Yeah. No. So yeah. the question and point that I wanted to make is that at 
clearly, and Sami did a good job of, of listing the modifications that so far have been ascribed to mRNA. And by hook or by crook, I mean, some of them may or may not be artifactual. But the fact that you limit the description to those modifications, or it speaks volumes, but also the fact that maybe we just don't know to, how to see others. So we are just limited by what technology offers now. But maybe by the time Sam is about to, to retire, he says, wow, this crazy new technology from Byron or whoever the egg it is, now shows that indeed there are like 50 of them that we just simply fail to detect. And this is the, the story because, I mean, and well, Brenda knows a little bit about why I'm saying this. I mean, when modifications were originally described, it took 30 years to, 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 to discover 30 and then sat there. Actually, from 1 to 30, it took 30 years with nothing happening. And even though the technology was so bad, they still got to 30. And then 1995, of course, is where Henri Grosjean calls the golden age of modification. So he jumped to 160 or 120, and now we are counting 185. And it is not just DNA and ribosomal RNA, it's non-coding RNAs and so on and so forth. So the point being that, um, I, I, although I do agree that M6A is, 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 I mean, the mapping methods for M6A are greatly improved. They do not address it at a single molecule, that is clear, and end-to-end, -end, which actually could provide a source of diversity and variability. And secondly, we don't know that we are there yet, because how can we know when we don't have the methodology? That's the point that I wanted to make. Yeah, and, and it's a lovely point, and I get to steal the responses. It's in my slots. So that's great. Um, I think I, I was really affected by your talk, Juan, where you talked about how RNA and RNA modifications can, can be thought of as a, as a response to the metabolic milieu around them. I, I, I quite like that. And I think for a lot of the cellular studies where we sequence these mods, uh, it's a shame they're all being grown in exactly the same media in this really consistent way. And I think some of the, I know there's been some work from Tom Suzuki where he changes the carbonate and off, off all sorts of other tRNA modifications and stuff that you can rationalize, it makes sense, but no one necessarily changes their workflows to take account of that. So I think that there, there is, I find it really surprising that most of the modifications appear to be in bacterial species. It's not really how I was raised to believe the bacteria are more complicated than the humans at the end. It doesn't really seem to match, match the sort of increasing complete complexity of genomic evolution. But um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. But I think quite a lot of the things that would change the experiments to capture these things aren't things we routinely do because everyone's still arguing about what M6A does because <laughs> because that's got so much mystery to it as well. So if, if I can just say something I know this is mostly Byron's it's Byron's time but one we do we do know what's in mRNA. You know, it's by mass spec and Frank Lyko had a great paper where he took mRNA and kept on purifying it after purifying it and found that all these modifications that were there other than M6A would go away and that they were probably contaminating tRNA fragments and other things. If one, there was something else, you should get a new mass spec peak because mass spec tells you the mass and mobility. Ability and we know the identification. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't rare modifications. Biology is messy, and I think you'll find every single tRNA modification will, enzyme will, every once in a while in one plate, one cell on a plate will accidentally hit an RNA and you'll get a little bit. But we know that there's nothing substantive at large amounts based on really, really good mass spectrometry other than M6A well, and the cap. I don't think mass spectrometry for mRNA is actually really, really good. But I will say the following. Well, the point that I make is more philosophical. That you don't, when you don't know where you are, where you are going, you don't know where you are, if you got there yet. So they, they, for instance, as, a, as, a, as an, an example of this, cyclic T6A, nobody knew that it existed. Because everybody was purifying their, TRN, their RNAs, tRNAs in this case, in trace buffer, which essentially destroys it. And it was only when, when uh, Susumo Nishimura whispered in Tom Suzuki's, Suzuki's ear that it may exist if he changed the buffer, it was found. So that speaks also for how we prepare things, how we treat RNA, right? And, um, and that's the, 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 the subtle point that I'm trying to make. I'm not arguing with you, I'm simply saying that 
Then the chapter is not closed yet, and that's why we are here. Um, it, okay. Is, hmm? yeah. Sorry, Nick. Uh, yeah. Did you did you want to say anything to wrap up? Uh, if there are no other questions, we can uh, just wrap this up. Um, yeah, it's probably a good place to wrap it up. I was probably going to say some things that I can't say, so yeah, that's fine. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, Byron. We really uh, appreciated your perspectives. Um, so let's let's go ahead and move on to uh, Steve Bruick. I think uh, I saw that uh, he's now on. So as Steve, as you're uh, yeah. pulling up the screen, uh, just a brief intro. Steve is uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of New Mexico, VP and CSO at Armonica Technologies. Okay, so let me, let me, the first preface is I didn't understand half of what was just said because I don't know anything about genetics. <clears throat> uh, my background is optics, uh, metamaterials, semiconductors, lithography, so nanofabrication kinds of things. So you'll hear a lot of nanofabrication and, and no genetics from me. <clears throat> just real quick, Stephen, so uh, you, your talk would have fit well with the first couple of talks, which were related to... Yeah these similar things. So don't feel like you're too out of place. It fits in really well here. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so so a couple of advertisement slides and then I'll get into the, the meat of it. Uh, we, we're we using Raman readout and Raman, I'll talk about that in some detail, but Raman gives you, you know, all the vibrational frequencies of the molecule. So it can tell you all the modifications. Uh, we have a potential of very long read performance. Uh, we're using surface enhanced Raman uh, with nanometer scale localization. Uh, and uh, one, one more, this, this is pure vaporware. We do not have a box. We have laboratories. <laughs> but, but this is what it's going to look like someday. Uh, and these are the things we, we think we can do. And I'll just skip all of that and get to, get to the meat. So this was our initial our initial plan and we, we're now somewhat changing it, but, but this is still gives you the basics of it. So we, we start out with getting DNA into a nano channel uh, and then getting it through a porous nanopore that slows it down dramatically. And then we read it out with, a, uh, with an enhancement structure at the top. <clears throat> Uh, and what you're seeing here, the, the spectra you're seeing, whoops, sorry about that. The spectrum you see over to the, to the right are ACTG and, and 5-methyl-C uh, in monolayer concentration on our enhancement structures. And you can see they all have distinct sp spectra. Uh, so the features of this platform are electrophoretic control of the, of the, of the translocation, which is by the voltage applied across this whole thing nanochannels to prepare the, the single-stranded DNA, uh, torturous nanopores to slow the DNA, uh, enhancement structures, which uh, are now metamaterial enhancement structures to provide single base localization and sensitivity. Uh, and it can be parallelized because we have lots of, you know, we can separate nanochannels by optical resolutions of, an of a micron and have thousands of nanochannels at the same time. <laughs> Okay, so Raman scattering. The, the promise of Raman scattering is that it provides the molecular details. The vibrational signatures are, are clearly sensitive to, to molecular bonding, and it provides a unique identification of all epigenetic variations. The problem is Raman is a weak effect. Uh, the bulk spectra, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, can require thousands to millions of molecules and spatial resolution is set by the focal spot size, which is much bigger than the nucleotide. Uh, so our approach is to use surface enhanced Raman scattering, which has demonstrated single molecule sensitivities, but usually in non-reproducible geometries and with difficult manufacturing, uh, manufacturing tricks that are hard to replicate. Uh, we've developed, a, a we, we believe, a manufacturable enhancement structure that provides the enhancement you need and spatial localization down to on the order of a nanometer uh, and has demonstrated single nucleotide sensitivities, which I'm going to try and prove to you, uh, and can be integrated into nanofluidic structures. 
So the, these are bulk Raman spectra of a, of a number of different variates, variant, variations. You see A, C, T, and G at the bottom, and then a, a number of other uh, <clears throat> epigenetic modifications. And the important point is they all have unique spectra. <clears throat> OK, so here's, let me talk a little bit about our optimization structure. Uh, we started out with a gold disk. Uh, and we did, and, and the, what you're seeing over on, on the left hand, uh, well, everywhere on this page are, are modeling results. And you get very strong enhancements, oops, very strong enhancements. <coughs> uh, but you learn a couple of things. So if you're doing, if you just put gold disc down on a piece of glass, you get a very big enhancement. Everything is wonderful. But in the real world, you need a sticking layer. You need something to hold the gold onto the substrate. Uh, and most people use, and we started out using metals like titanium or nickel, and that kills the enhancement. So, so you can see that here. If, if you look at this curve right here, this is beta. Beta is the, the field at the hotspot divided by the incident field. So you need betas of, of a few hundred to get to, to a single molecule sensitivity. And you can see you, you've, got a, you've got a very strong beta and and they they tune with the size of these things, with the diameter and the and the height and everything else you want to add. Uh, but you can see that you 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 get a strong enhancement if you just put gold down. But if you add the sticking layer, you're screwed. Right, and you have nothing, almost nothing. Uh, it turned, we we learned how to use SaO two as the sticking layer, and that that improves life a little bit. Uh, <coughs> Then we looked at, uh, and, and I'll show you how to get it all back in a second. Uh, and that, that's from this, this overhang of the, the pedestal. So if instead of, so if you look at, the, these are MIM structures, and I'll talk about those in a second. But, but if you look at the bottom, there's a SiO2 sticking layer that's a, the same size as the pillar. Here it's overhanging by five nanometers on each side, and here it's overhanging by 10 nanometers on each side. And you can see that you get all the enhancement back. So, so it, this is the point is that subtle engineering can can get you a strong enhancement, and and you have to understand what you're doing in detail to to get there. Uh, now, I showed you a MIM. MIM is a metal insulator, metal structure, and the big advantage of it is that it gives you a broader resonance because you have both an electric dipole resonance associated with the gold disk and a magnetic dipole resonance associated with the loop that's created. And that allows you to tune one, put one at the stokes and one at the pump. Uh, and then, uh, then if you go to elliptical structures, you can further concentrate the fields due to lightning rod effects. And, and we, should, we, we'll, we haven't done that yet, but we, we are expecting much higher enhancements. <coughs> uh, so here are experimental verifications of that. So here's a, uh, the first is a disk. Uh, these are the simulations. These are the experiments, and you can see that there was a disk. We get a very, we get a marginal signal. When we add the MIM, we get a bigger signal, and when we add what we call MIM plus, we get a much bigger signal. And the MIM plus is just adding an extra layer to bring the the to, to create the overhang that I mentioned. Uh, and if we compare the size of the disk, these are again theoretical calculations on the left, experiment on the right, and you can see. And the the well the the, the blue curve is is the theory is the beta square beta squared at the pump times beta squared at the Stokes that we extract from from these simulations, and the experiment of the red dots, and you can see reasonably good agreement. <clears throat> okay, so now is it enough? Uh, and and by the way, I, I didn't emphasize it, but the, the enhancement is fairly broad in the circumference around the disk, but is less than a nanometer, both vertically and away from the disk. So we, uh, in two dimensions, we have confinement to, to, <coughs> to atomic dimensions. Uh, so what, what you're seeing here is, is, mono, is spectra from a dilute solution of uh, A and C that that has been uh, been soaked and then rinsed. So, so we're looking at adsorbed molecules. And in this case, it was 1 16th of, of a monolayer. And we see every spectra sees A and C. And you can see the A and C. The, this is the A, this is the C. Uh, 
You see them in every spectrum. Uh, then we went to 1 over 512, uh, and you can see that now roughly 50% of the, of the spectra show nothing, uh, and, and you're, you're seeing more, more single A's, and more, more spectra that show, only show A or only show C. Uh, and if we go to further dilution, and this is our, down to 1 over 1024, what you see is, is what looks like single molecule sensitivity. So now 90% of the spectra show nothing, uh, but A and C show up distinctly as separate, and A and C shows up in a, in a smaller ratio. All of this is consistent with Poisson statistics, so we think we're seeing a single molecule. Uh, and what I'm showing you on the, on the left-hand side is just if we look at A only or C only, we see A only or C only. <clears throat> Okay, now we're moving to, to a, a more manufacturable platform. Uh, what you're seeing here are 40 nanometer channels written by e-beam lithography with some, what we call a pinball structure to unravel the DNA. It gets it in and goes in through here. Now downstream, we're, we put an enhancement structure. And that, that we're, we are now learning how to do the flow control in these structures, we have yet to fire it in anger and to actually see a Raman signal from, from the DNA that, but we know we can tether DNA and hang it here and we're, we're confident we're gonna see strong signals. Uh, we are a small company, uh, very small. We have nine people, uh, but we have two locations, Albuquerque and San Diego. Uh, we're venture capital funded and uh, and and that's that's basically our story. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Steve. <clears throat> uh, are there any questions for Steve? Uh, I had a question, um, Steve. Um, how how are you planning to actually do the sequencing? I mean, so when you is is there a polymerase that incorporates nucleotides, or are you just flowing the DNA past that uh, uh, Raman spectra? You're, well, you're we're, 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 we're hoping, I, I don't know, planning is the right word, but hoping that we can control the motion with, uh, with pulsed electric fields. And because as the DNA flows by, you generate as, the Raman. Right, you generate, you generate the Raman, and we, we want to ratchet it with, with electric fields. We know we can stop it with an electric field. We can stop it in the nanochannel, uh, and we're, we're planning to ratchet it, but we are clearly going to have problems with whole polymers and issues of, of sequences of stretches of A's and C's. And this would be single-stranded DNA, or can you do this with double-stranded DNA? Uh, single-stranded DNA. Single-stranded, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Juan, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So, so in the... Um... When one talks about RNA modification, you know, there is 185 different types, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. then do you then see a case where the limitation of Raman spectra is that some modifications are going to give you very similar readouts? Uh, I, I won't guarantee that we'll see all 185, but, but and, and actually the problems, which I didn't talk about, or impurities and other things that get in there and, conf and confound your spectra because we're working close to us close to a limit of, of signal to noise of course yeah. uh, right now the spectra take us 10 seconds to take that's way too long to to get enough information so we, we need to which is why we're trying so hard to improve the the sensitivity the the uh, the enhancement factors uh, our, our goal is to get to one thirtieth of a second and to have the full spectrum, but we, we do have a, a prob problems, particularly with carbon impurities that get in there in, in part of the spectral region and block. And when they show up, you can't tell what's real and what's what's an impurity. Thank you. So we don't, we don't have an, I don't have a good answer yet, but, but I think uh, if we can get the full spectra, Raman has the capability of, of, of uh, not, not every, every peak will be unique, but the whole spectrum is unique. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Steve? So, Steve, I have a question. So, I and I may have missed this in your slides, um, but uh, maybe you can speak to it. <clears throat> uh, so, what 
what do you think is sort of the theoretical limit in terms of how many molecules you need to get sufficient signal? Like, is, is it theoretically possible to get down to a single molecule read and get sufficient signal to determine the sequence? Um, and could you speak on that in terms of just uh, concentration required? Yeah, well, that's what I, I was, uh, I guess I didn't get across, but I was hoping to convince you of is that I can see a single, either A or C at this point is all we were looking at in, yeah. that, in that experiment, but but we were down to a single A, uh, a single adenine molecule. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and and so that, that speaks to the spatial localization uh, as well as to the, the signal strengths. And as I, so this is, I, I as, as, as I understand the field, this is the first time anyone has demonstrated non-resonant Raman in a, in a manufacturable structure at a single molecule level. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. I, I did, I did, uh, I know you were building towards that and then I, I, uh, I missed it, but that's, uh, I think that that's, you know, one of the challenges in this field with RNA is that we don't have, you know, there's no ability to replicate the molecules and, and, and also replicate the modifications yeah. with this. And so uh, that's really exciting. Yeah, and what will the other limitation we're facing at the moment is just getting the getting that that RNA or DNA strand into the into the right place, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and we have some strategies for that, but we they're yet to be proven. Great. And I, I think we have a little bit of time, and there's a question that was added to the to the chat here. I'll just read it. Uh, it's from Kaleem Mir. Uh, so they were asking about how was the data that you showed on the RNA modifications taken? Uh, was it bulk ramen or was it single molecule? Well, I showed both bulk and single molecule. <laughs> the, 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 the spectra that I showed, let me go back to it. Yeah, the, these are bulk ramen. But... Uh, but uh, and I didn't even comment on them. But let me find. But but these are these these they're not single molecule, but they are on our they're monolayers on our enhancement structure. So they're soaked monolayers. They, typically, we think about 300, 300 molecules contributing to those Raman signatures, and then we see the same Raman signature, but not with as good a signal to noise. Of course, when we get down to one molecule. Right. Uh, any other questions for Steve? Okay, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I uh, remain optimistic about you know, technology development in this area. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Tricia. Yeah, all I'll say is thank you all. Thanks to um, all of our great speakers today. I think we had a really interesting um, and stimulating conversation about where we're going. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our committee members. Um, and if the committee members wouldn't mind just staying on a few extra minutes, um, that would be really great. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That's everyone. Yep, we're good. All right, folks. Wasn't exactly what we had intended with this session, but I think it was good information.